talk um, a bit about kind of the eating and the drinking. You said that you wanted to go back to the wine and the bacon, right? It's kind of the desires of the flesh, right? How do you, how did you make a transition to care more about um, the desires that you felt you got from God as opposed to the desires of the flesh and moving away from the eating and the drinking, right, to the peace and joy? Right. Masala, that's a really brilliant question. Thank you so much. Does that go ahead? So, well, what's, um, there is a big, there is a big, there is a transition from one way of life to another. Um, so one day, literally the day before I took my shahada, I would have been smoking and drinking, and I wouldn't have been praying. And then I went into a masjid and I took my shahada, and suddenly, I mean, first of all, it's a massive feeling. First of all, it is huge. Wow. <laughs> it's huge. I, I can't describe it. I mean, it's very common for um, imams and people who take shahada to see the person collapse or cry. or You just don't know what the reaction is going to be, but it's very big. Um, for me, I wanted to prove to myself and the friend that I was with that I was still going to be myself. So when I took my shahada, although it came with honesty, I was love, and I knew God was one, and I knew Muhammad was his prophet, and I knew I was Muslim. The first thing I did was I went to a bar and I got, uh, got drunk. Because I wanted to prove to myself that I could be Muslim and Islam could fit into my life. Not that I had to change. So that was day one. And then when I got home, I realized I had alcohol in my mouth. And the taste. And I thought about saying the name Allah with the taste of alcohol in my mouth. And no matter how many times I brushed my teeth or washed my mouth, I couldn't bring myself to pray that night. And so I prayed the next day. And although it seems really sudden to me now, like everything happened overnight, thank goodness, thank you God that I kept diaries. I'm a journalist, so I have diaries. And actually, it took weeks. It felt really instant. But it took weeks for me to pray five times a day, to learn the prayers, and to just be in that way of life. And there is the most, as far as I'm concerned, for a new Muslim, the most important thing to me was the five daily prayers. Because it, it is a cleansing process. You wake up with Allah's name on your lips, and you thank him for waking up, and you say Fajr. And then you know you're going to do your morning work, and then around lunchtime, you're going to be speaking to Allah again. So there's your incentive. And in the afternoon, and in the evening, and before you go to sleep. So in between those, you don't want to foul your mouth. And then you're, it's just incredible what, what the Salah does. I, I really, I, I don't know what else to say apart from that. And the, the miraculous thing was, that although I'd smoked for 30 years, Two days after I took my salah, I mean my, my shahada, maybe the next day I stopped smoking. I tried to smoke, it tasted disgusting. And uh, I never drank again. And I've never wanted to drink again. SubhanAllah. And it just went. Because you're just connected. You just see the universe in a completely different way. There is a much bigger, longer answer. I hope I wasn't offering, but alhamdulillah. Thank you, it's a brilliant question. Uh, two questions, one for the sister and one for the brother. Uh, thanks, uh, thank you very much for bringing this uh, your inspiring story, inspiring story to us, uh, Journey to Islam, and also bringing the cause of uh, Gaza to not only the journalism but up here as well. My question to you is, uh, when you accepted that uh, job offer from uh, that either the Muslim channel, did you say that? Uh, did you ever find out, you know, that why did he choose you and at that time you were not even a Muslim and did you ever get an uh, idea why did he choose you? And second part of the question would be that usually when you are reversed, should I say that, you know, the families kind of abandon you and uh, have animosity. Uh, did any of that happen to you, including the player family? Okay, thank you very much, brother. So the first question was when I, I was offered the job at the Islam channel, why did Muhammad Ali offer me that job? I will ask him that question. I see him quite regularly at events. My guess is that he's someone who uh, just knows 
how to get good people on board with this project. The Islam Channel was very new, and I was quite famous, and I was pro-Palestinian, so I think it was more of a, a kind of, that sort of thought process. I was sympathetic to the, to the Muslims, and so that was, he was coming from that kind of business perspective, is my thought. But alhamdulillah, Allah knows best. And then uh, regarding my family, well, uh, I don't speak to Tony Blair. <laughs> you know, he made 70 million out of the deaths in Iraq. As if the deaths weren't enough, you then get paid vast amounts of money for taking part in the mass slaughter of Muslims. It would be my duty to arrest him if I saw him. And I mean that. I'm telling you right now, I would arrest him for war crimes, for crimes against humanity. So, um, ex-world leaders tend to not like that. So I don't see Tony. Uh, my family have been very, very kind, thanks be to God. My daughters, when I came back from my experience in the mosque, I said to them, I'm thinking about becoming Muslim, what do you think? And they were 10 and 8 at the time. And they said, we're going to make a list of questions and come back. So they went away and they came back and they had a list of questions. And they asked them like this. These were the questions, genuinely. Question number one. When you are a Muslim, will you still be our mummy? <laughs> Beautiful, Marshall. I said, yeah, I'll still be your mummy. In fact, I'll be a better mummy. Question number two. When you are Muslim, will you still drink alcohol? That will tell you how much alcohol I drank. That my daughters were worried. I said, I'll never drink alcohol again. They said, Hooray! Question number three was, when you're a Muslim, will you show your chest area in public? I said, what? They said, you dress very immodestly, and you always wear low-cut tops. Will you do that when you're a Muslim? I said, if I'm a Muslim, I will always be covered from head to toe in public. My daughter said, we love Islam, and they accepted Islam. Allah <laughs> Akbar. You see the fitra of children. You see how they want a mother to be the center of the family. You see how they want you to stick with the halal and avoid the haram. You see how they want us to be dignified in public. I don't know where these questions came from. I don't, I'll see, well, I don't know, but they knew these things. Thank you, brother. Good questions. So my question to Brother Khalil is, uh, as the statistics show that uh, after 9-11, so many years after, a decade after, the animosity against the Muslim has actually increased many forms. And we all believe, you know, that uh, media and journalism has a lot to do with that. So my question to you is, on the defamation going around, is there a case for defamation? defamation? We've had cases in the past for defamation. We've sued people like Joe Kaufman for slandering all the Muslim organizations and causing a big fitna. CARE has sued people for this, and they've had no success because of how open this country is to free speech, and the definition of slander and libel is very specific, and if you're a public figure, if you speak in public, they are allowed to almost do anything to say about each other. So it's, it's a problem. We have. Right now we're looking at a case, uh, uh, a sheikh in uh, Yasser Qadri, uh, who's uh, in Tennessee. And he might have the best winnable case for this type of slander, uh, but we're not sure yet. So we're continuing to try to find a case that will help us succeed with this uh, Islamophobic environment. But, you know, I, I, I want people to be clear on what I'm saying. I, I don't want this problem to be well, it's the media's fault and this and that. I mean, right now, as Muslims, we know that some people, or most Americans, are open-minded. They want to hear both sides of the story. They're, they're trying to be fair and balanced. But there's some people that have already made up their mind. Some people that are already acting on whatever their conclusion is. And those who are negative and hostile to Islam, we call them Islamophobes. We call these people, you know, that are, that are you know, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. And these people are few in number. They're not the majority. The majority are not Islamophobic. But the people that are Islamophobic could be anybody, right? It could be your neighbor. It could be your coworker. 
It could be your boss. It could be an elected official. It could be somebody in the media. It could be somebody in a position of authority or power. And when these people who have authority, who have power, who have influence, and are Islamophobic, they can make other people's lives miserable. And when that happens, we as a community need to stand up. And we need to say no. We need to exercise our rights. We need to protect these freedoms, this liberty that everybody else has fought and died for, and not just roll over and say, well, that's not me, or that's not us, or we, it's not, you know, we have to collectively care about this issue, and every time we have an opportunity, have our voice heard, so that we're setting the precedent, setting the course, and holding ourselves and others accountable for what's happening. Inshallah. Thank you. Laura, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Um, you're a Muslim, and But there are many more amazing stories everywhere in the world, every single day, okay? We just don't read about them. So you go out and make your own story. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> I think deserves a clap. That was great. That was a great question. <laughs> one day cover issues of, oh, about Palestine. And I wanted to ask you, did you face any discrimination since you were, you are pro-Palestinian, you know, being there? Did uh, the Israeli government give you a hard time? Uh, just, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, prejudice. When I put the scarf on, um, in 2010, I was working some of the time with Sky News. You all heard of Sky News, right? So I used to do their newspaper reviews, and I'd been doing it for 10 or 12 years, so I was well known for it. And I had a regular slot. And for the first month, I would wear the hijab in the taxi, and then take it off in the taxi and go to work without hijab on. And that didn't really fit well with my heart. So I thought, that's hypocrisy. You know, you've lived, you've lived this part of your life fighting against lies, and you're lying. So what's going on? You know, you, you are Muslim, be Muslim. So one Saturday morning, I went to work, and I got out of the taxi, and I kept my hijab on, and I could feel my cheeks were really wet. And I walked through the newsroom, and nobody said anything. And I walked into the makeup room, this was the worst part. This, I, I hated that feeling, because they were all, you know, they'd see me, they'd see me, being out of parties and having my hair done, and then I was like this, and they're very professional. Morning, Laura. How are you? Fine. Oh, would you want how much? I said less than I used to have, and they kind of laughed. Yeah, everyone. So you have got two types of people. Broadly speaking, you've got the people who are going to say what they think, and they're going to be, "Well, I think this, and I'll say it." And people are too scared, and they don't know what's the right way, and so everyone was very nervous. Then I went and did my job live on air. Same as I'd done for 12 years. The only difference was this. On the Monday morning, I got a call from Sky News. Sorry, Laura, we won't be using you anymore. We found somebody else. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Now, I've got no proof, and there never will be any proof, that it was linked to me being in hijab. And you will be right to say to me, I see lots of hijabi newswomen. There are lots of women in hijab, right? True? There are. Alhamdulillah. But they ain't reverts. <laughs> And they're not related to politicians. Because there is a line. And the line is this. The line is that the people who hate Islam don't want the non-Muslims to know that they can all become Muslim. They are happy with it seeming like it's for brown people who get bombed. I'm speaking bluntly here. But if, if local people have can become is Muslim, maybe Islam's okay. So there is a line. You know, we keep constantly finding it. So uh, that was the prejudice that I faced. Hi. And good luck, by the way. 
for you with your career? Uh, so I, um, I, think I, speak to, um, I think I speak for everyone, and I want to thank you both for joining us this evening. It was really wonderful having you here. Um, I'm Taylor Chazelle, and I'm the sister who uh, was here before me. I'm an English major, um, and I do want to get involved with um, speaking against injustices in the world and stuff like that. Um, so I just wanted to ask either either of you whoever wishes to answer. Um, what's the best way to get involved in getting your voice heard um, for I guess a beginner? So yeah, thank you. Okay, mashallah, really nice to hear from you. Bless you. Um, getting your voice heard. Um, I mean, blogging is always good. Blogging about who you are and what you believe. You know, the more young Muslim sisters who are out there uh, talking about what Islam is in, their, in, in your lives, it makes a difference. People stumble across these things. And uh, you, can become, you can write books, you can, you know, anything that, that gives a, a, a different narrative to what's being out there is a great thing. So just keep writing and, uh, and inshallah somebody will find it. Yes. All I want to add is for you to take that advice, just have the intention. If you make a sincere intention to be active, to make a difference or whatever, Allah will open up doors that we don't know about. We can't guide you, right? But if you have the niyyah, Allah will present many opportunities. There's an ocean that needs to be done. And everybody, you know, one of the beautiful things about Lauren's story, and, and this is what gets me, is that as Muslims, we always think that dawah, right, and you need to be a scholar, you need to be a dai, you need to know how to say it, you need to know what to say and when to say it, and have all this perfection in delivering a message. But Lauren is proof that each one of us in this room tonight have a power that we don't recognize, a power that if we are just practicing Muslims, if we're proud Muslims, if we act and behave in, in, in our circle of influence, whatever that is, we can change people's lives. Not only have I heard Lauren's story of how people affected her and changed her heart, I have other speakers that I've listened to. That go, there was a guard in Guantanamo Bay, right? A man named Terry Holbrook. He's guarding the prisoners, and he takes shahad. And they didn't give him dawah. They didn't talk to him. He talked to them. But because of their manners, because of how they act, how they smile in their life, it changed his world. So that is something that I think all of us can appreciate, is how powerful Allah has given us the beauty of Islam and to make a difference wherever we are. Do you ever think of being Christian again? <laughs> Sorry, say again, sister. Do you ever think of being Christian again? Uh, oh, a great question. I've never actually been asked that. Um, no, never. Because I never believed that God was three in one. Buy one, get one free anyway. God, God was always one to me. Um, and, and you know what? A lot of Christians, I think a lot more than we know, Pray to God. This kind of thing of Jesus as God was a minority view that is being forced on people. Um, what do you think, brother? <laughs> um, just to be clear, I, I was Christian and I wanted all of you to be Christian. You know, I wanted you to take Jesus as your Savior. But Alhamdulillah, my study of Christianity led me to Islam. Not reading the, the Quran, not studying Islam. I knew nothing really about Islam when I embraced Islam. I started to see the Bible order me to follow the Prophet The book that the Christians use tell them even today to be Muslim. So, I don't want to be a Christian. I actually, I'm, I'm a Christian who's practicing what I'm told. So I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I have a question to brother. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Okay, what is the status of her case now? And uh, did Pakistani government really fund that case or not? Yeah, um, actually, Dr. Afia's case is is sad at the moment. She's in jail in Carswell Air Force Base, sentenced to 86 years in prison. 
<laughs> okay. Well, maybe we should talk when it's over. Um, and uh, we were approached uh, after, I don't have time to go through all the specifics, but anyway, she went missing six years. She showed up in Ghazni, Afghanistan. She got arrested. Uh, and then she was interrogated, and then in that interrogation process, allegedly, she took a rifle away from a U.S. soldier and tried to shoot people in a small room that was 20 people in a room smaller than the stage. She missed everybody. She got shot twice, and she stood trial for allegedly attacking her captors. Yeah, and when she was uh, being uh, flown back to New York, her brother in Houston called the Muslim Legal Fund, and we agreed to find a legal team and uh, to take her case, but there was so much politics and so much activism around her case that there was pressure being put in Pakistan and on the embassy in America to help her in some way. And so we went to the Pakistani embassy in the Washington, D.C., and we put together a legal team and presented it to the embassy, and with the pressure they received from overseas and locally, they funded her case. So there was a $2 million check written on behalf of the four lawyers that defended her that we put together with her family that the Pakistani embassy wrote the check for. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Um, on, the, um, on the matter of our dear sister, Afia, I just want to add a couple of things. The first is that I met her sister Fauzia in Pakistan just over a year ago. And she told me that the family, the last time they'd spoken to uh, Afia, I think was Ramadan 2011. After years, this young woman had been missing for years. And then she turned up and the Americans had made an accusation and they jailed her for 86 years. Her family hasn't seen her. Her son Suleiman, who was 18 months, I think, disappeared while she was in American capture. Uh, two older children traumatized, subhanAllah. Um, her family told me that in prison, Afia managed to make a phone call to her mother in Pakistan. And her mother was sobbing. Can you imagine if this was your daughter? Raped, beaten, a child missing. She's in prison. And sister Afia said, mom, don't cry, because I am so happy. And her mother said, how can you be happy? She said, because every night, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes to see me. In my dreams, and last night, he introduced me to his wife Aisha. SubhanAllah, this is the mercy. But meanwhile, her body is being persecuted in this terrible center in America and myself and some sisters in the United Kingdom want to kickstart the campaign to remind people about this and to encourage the American government to have mercy on this mother and to send her to Pakistan. So repatriate her. So I'm looking for some young people with expertise in marketing and social media who might like to be involved in this campaign. This is coming up, we're gonna do something in June, and we really need skilled people in marketing and social media. So if anybody's here, inshallah, please come and help. I think that's all we have time for before we pray.